Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Consumer Affairs webinar on fiscal fitness and credit counseling. My name is Adam Burr. My partner today is Zach Passmore. Both of us are the department's attorneys. We protect consumers by making sure that businesses follow the law. We have been with the department for nearly five years. While working for the department, I've bought a house and two vehicles. I also use my credit card to pay for pretty much everything else that I buy. Likewise, Zach has bought vehicles since working for the department, and he also uses his credit debit cards to make everyday purchases. So that makes us both consumers just like you. Now we also have the legal disclaimer to do. So this presentation is not meant to serve as a substitute for reading the various laws discussed, seeking legal counsel, or otherwise requesting department's guidance and or interpretations on the laws it administers and enforces. The presentation merely serves as an introduction and an overview. So today we'll go over a brief intro of the department. Then I will cover the physical fitness section, which will include some basic terms and contractual matters. Then I'll turn it over to Zach, who will cover the credit counseling section, which will cover uh, types of services, tips, and credit repair scams. Then we'll go over some of the free resources available on our website. So here is our website. If you click the how do I on the homepage, you can find out how to do the most common things through our website, such as filing a complaint, uh, getting a license, backgrounding a business, reporting identity theft and scams, and requesting a presentation. Now I want to show you how to check to see if a business is licensed. So from our homepage, click on Licensee Lookup. You'll then be able to open up Excel spreadsheets of the licensees for the various programs that we regulate. We regulate about 14 or 15 different industries. And of particular interest for this presentation would be credit counselors, and physical fitness service providers. So now we come to the heart of today's presentation, what you should know about physical fitness and credit counseling. We'll start things off with what you should know about physical fitness. First, let's look at the definition of physical fitness services. It's important to know the definition because if the business does not meet the definition of providing physical fitness services, then the Physical Fitness Services Act does not apply. However, if the business does meet the definition of providing physical fitness services, then the Physical Fitness Services Act does apply. So what exactly are physical fitness services? They are facilities and services for the development of physical fitness through exercise or weight control. The term includes health or exercise centers, clubs, studios, or classes, health spas, weight control centers, clinics, or studios, figure salons, tanning centers, and athletic or sport clubs. Now, what are not considered to be physical fitness services? Rehabilitative therapy administered by a licensed physical therapist. And even if it fits the definition of physical fitness services, the following are exempt from the Physical Fitness Services Act. We have the state of South Carolina and any of its political subdivisions and also any not-for-profit corporations. Now, what about gymnastics, martial arts, dance studios, et cetera? So all would be considered to be physical fitness centers if they are advertising as physical fitness centers. So here are a few examples of some advertising. So martial arts is a great way to stay physically fit. Here, physical fitness is being promoted. Gymnastics will allow your child to develop strength, agility, and coordination. So here, strength, agility, and coordination are all byproducts of physical fitness 
So physical fitness is being promoted. Now, physical fitness centers must be licensed by the department. So when you are choosing a physical fitness center, make sure that you choose one that is licensed by the department. And the reason for that is that a licensed physical fitness center means that if required, the center has a contract that complies with South Carolina law, and if required, the center maintains an appropriate surety bond. Now, if these things are required, the department makes physical fitness centers have these two things before issuing a license to the center. Now, this license must be conspicuously posted at every location where monies or contracts are received by the center. So now let's look at the membership options that physical fitness centers typically offer. Now, there are three types of membership plans that the department typically sees with the physical fitness center um, memberships. They are month to month, prepaid, and credit. And it's important to understand what the membership options are because the membership options trigger certain other rights that you have. So let's look at them. With the month to month, you pay monthly for the months that you want to use the facility. There's no long term commitment, and you should be able to cancel at any time. Prepaid means that you pay in advance for the right to use the facilities. So for example, you pay $500 up front for a 12 month contract. It's prepaid because the center has not yet earned the money for the provision of the monthly services after the first month. Now credit means that either the debt is payable in installments or a credit service charge is made. So let's go over what those terms mean as they deal with credit contracts. First, we'll look at what does payable and installments mean. So payable and installments means four or more periodic payments, excluding a down payment in which a credit service charge is not imposed. So for example, you sign a 12 month contract the amount due is $600. The center permits you to pay 12 $50 payments. So because it is four or more installments, the debt is considered to be payable in installments. Now, there are some other instances in which a debt could be payable in installments, but they are rare, especially in the context of gym memberships. So we won't go over them in this presentation. Now, the other way to have credit is with a credit service charge. So what exactly is a credit service charge? It's an extra charge that you must pay as a result of paying over time instead of purchasing with cash. So think of it kind of like interest. So let's say that you sign a 12 month contract and you have two options. You can either pay in full for $500 which is called the cash price, or you can make 12 $50 payments, which would be the credit price. Now, you'll notice there's an extra $100 for uh, paying the 12 installments versus paying all up front. That $100 difference between the cash price and the credit price is the credit service charge, and it's known as the time price differential. Now, whenever you have credit contracts, certain disclosures must be made to you. The Federal Truth in Lending Act requires that certain disclosures be made to you when making credit transactions. These disclosures are often in the form of easy to read boxes known as TILA boxes. Now, the purpose of the TILA boxes is to make it easy for you to see the um, overall cost of credit. Now, if there is a time price differential in a GEM contract, state law requires another disclosure, which must be separate from any required TILA disclosure.
Now, prepaid and credit contracts must be in writing if the term is more than three months in duration or the total cost is more than $200 in amount. However, for personal training, the cost must be more than $300 in amount. Now, the contract must reveal the finance charge, if any, that you agree to pay. The contract must also clearly state the street address or location of the center or outlets, the outlets which you may use, the major facilities and services offered, and which services are not subject to a refund. And the contracts must also have the appropriate till of disclosures and contain a right to cancel. Now, contracts must not allow for late fees to be imposed before you are more than 10 days late. Allow late fees to exceed the lesser of 5% of the unpaid installment or $23, unless a minimum late fee is contracted for, in which case it cannot exceed $9.20. The contracts cannot seek attorney's fees from you that exceed 15% of the unpaid installment. They cannot waive the required provisions of the Physical Fitness Services Act. They generally cannot be for a term longer than 24 months. Uh, however, there is a little caveat to that. Uh, a contract can be for up to 36 months if the center meets certain conditions and gets permission in writing from the department. And also the contract cannot have a length measured by your life, the life of the center, or any other similar indefinite term. Now remember that any contractual provision that does not comply with the Physical Fitness Services Act is unenforceable against you. Now, as we mentioned a couple slides ago, a credit and prepaid contracts must have a right to cancel. And you have a right to cancel within three business days after signing the contract. Your death, a substantial physical disability certified by a physician, which makes it permanently impossible for you to use the center services, or your permanent relocation to a residence over 50 miles distant from an outlet operated by the center, if the center is unable to arrange for your use of another center with equivalent major facilities and services. Now, your death is a reason for cancellation, and that might seem like a strange reason for cancellation, but it actually means that the contract cannot be enforced against your estate. Also, other than the cancellation within the three business days, the Physical Fitness Center may require proof if any of the other events triggering cancellation rights occur. Now, credit and prepaid contracts may also have more liberal rights of cancellation than those outlined in the statute. So, for example, the contract allows you for a right of cancellation when you re relocate to a residence 25 miles distant from the nearest outlet, while the statute calls for 50 miles. Now, credit and prepaid contracts may provide uh, for a period, for an extension of the term of the agreement for a period equal to a period of temporary disability or pregnancy or for any other justifiable or reasonable cause. Now, during the pandemic, when the governor uh, ordered physical fitness centers to be shut down for a few weeks, uh, many of the gyms went ahead and they didn't charge their members for the months that they were they were not open. But they went ahead and extended the contracts. So that would be a, another justifiable reason or cause for an extension of the term of the agreement. Now, these contracts can specify that the written contract constitutes the entire agreement between the parties 
and they can have a renewal option. Now, speaking of the renewal options, there are two types of renewal options. There's the standard renewal option and also the automatic renewal option. Now, with the standard renewal option, it can be for longer than one month, but it can't be for longer than one year. It must be exercised by you in writing or by payment of part or all of the renewal price. And it must be exercised near the expiration of the original contract. Now, the other one is the automatic renewal option. And with the automatic renewal option, you must opt in to automatic renewal by initialing the provision for automatic renewal. The provision must be disclosed to you on the front page of the contract in bold 14 point font. And the contract will effectively become month to month. The center must notify you of the automatic renewal near the expiration of the original contract. And the price may not increase or decrease without written notice of 30 to 60 days before the change in price. Now, we are seeing some complaints about the automatic renewal provision. You would have had to have opted in to an automatic renewal at the beginning of the contract, and you must be notified of the automatic renewal near the end of the contract. So it is important to make sure that you update your address with the center if you move in the middle of the contract. Now, many gyms are using electronic contracts where the contracts are made on tablets and copies are emailed to consumers. Electronically signed contracts are just as valid as contracts signed with a pen. You want to make sure that you check your email for the copy of the electronically signed contract. Now, under federal law, centers cannot make electronic funds transfer, including ACH, a condition of extending credit. It can be an option for payment as a convenience for you. It just can't be required as a condition of the extension of credit. Now, some centers might charge you a processing fee for using your credit card to make a payment. This practice is legal. However, if centers are going to charge a processing fee for using a credit card as a payment method on a credit contract, then that charge must be included in the calculation of the finance charge, and it also must be properly disclosed to you. So here are some general tips for you before you sign up for a gym membership. Now, you want to talk to your doctor before beginning a workout plan. You want to make sure that any exercise plan would be safe for you. Similarly, you want to listen to the gym staff to perform the exercises correctly so that you don't injure yourself. This would include any appropriate warm-ups or cool-downs. You want to be leery of promises of rapid results with little effort. It took time putting that weight on, so it will take some time and effort to get that weight off. Now, not all gyms are the, sh are the same. You should shop around and see what features are offered and what works best for you. So some gyms might have better equipment than others. Some gyms might offer childcare or tanning services while others don't. Some gyms have a model where you can come work out whenever you want. Some gyms have a model where you can only work out as part of a class. You want to see what features will work best for you. And lastly, Carefully read that membership agreement before signing. You want to make sure that you understand what your rights and responsibilities are. So now I'm going to turn it over to Zach to go over credit counseling.
Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Adam. Um, as Adam said, my name is Zach Passmore, and I'm an enforcement attorney here at the Department of Consumer Affairs. And uh, I hope everyone's new year is starting off well and uh, going in the direction that that you hope for. And uh, we are today providing a little bit of information that might help you kickstarting some of those goals uh, that you may have at the beginning of the year. Um, particularly pertaining to um, businesses that we license. So of course we've dealt with physical fitness now, it's on a lot of people's resolutions list and now we'll kind of cover the, um, some information maybe help with that uh, resolution of maybe shoring up your finances. And uh, for our purposes today, that means credit counseling. So before I go into um, basically what credit counseling services are and, and how the department is involved in them, I'll take a quick tangent and talk about uh, why credit counseling services may be important for people. And that is because of credit reports. So credit reports essentially are a, um, a report showing how um, a consumer is using credit and whether or not they're making their their payments on time. There are several types of information that are included in a person's credit report, such as personal information, including uh, names that they've used in the past or their current name, birth date, any phone numbers that that person has used over time, any addresses that they have uh, lived at, including and including certain personal information such as social security number. Now credit, uh, credit report will list out a person's credit accounts, both current and past accounts, including the credit limits that a person has, uh, the account balance on that account, person's payment history, whether positive or negative. It will have the creditor's name and the dates in which that account was opened or closed. A credit report will also contain many different types of public records, including any liens that are on a person's property. Uh, if they've been involved in any civil suits or judgments against them, those amounts for the judgments. And if it's been within the past 10 years, any bankruptcies that a person has filed. And finally, also listed on a credit report are the types of inquiries made, whether they are hard inquiries or soft inquiries. Uh, a hard credit inquiry is one when you submit a credit application and the creditor pulls your credit, uh, the detailed list showing all this information. That is a hard inquiry and that will affect what I will talk about on the next slide, which is your credit score. But your credit report will also lift any or will also list any soft inquiries that have been made upon your credit report. A soft inquiry will show kind of basic information regarding your credit report, maybe not necessarily all the information, but that's what is utilized by either you when you're, for instance, checking a credit score, or uh, if you have an existing creditor, if they're just kind of following up on your information, they will pull a soft inquiry. Uh, this will not affect uh, a credit score. So probably the most important advice that we can give at the department for uh, financial health is to regularly check your credit report. You want to review it carefully uh, to see if there are any inaccuracies in it. And you want to evaluate that these debts that are listed on your report are actually yours. Now, if you do pull your credit report and you notice that there are some items listed that are not yours, uh, you do have the right to dispute those debts. So if you do dispute the debt, there are kind of, there is an avenue, there is a method for doing this, and we have other webinars that go into this in greater detail. But typically when you dispute a debt, a consumer reporting agency typically has 30 days to reinvestigate uh, whether or not the debt on your report is accurate. If they cannot verify that the debt is accurate, then it must be removed from your credit report. Uh, with the caveat that the debt can be reinserted uh, upon certification from the creditor that the debt is in fact accurate. 
So if you, you're checking your credit report and you either addressed any of the inaccurate items on your credit report or what is left are legitimate debts, then at that point you need to evaluate a course of action to address those debts. As I kind of mentioned earlier, one of the, though it's not necessarily in a credit report, it is a, it can be a part of someone's credit history and that is credit score. It is a three digit number that is designed to predict for creditors whether or not uh, you will pay your bills on time or if you are a potential credit risk. Uh, though there are many different types of scores out there, typically the higher your score, the better credit terms you will be offered. Uh, and again, generally speaking, credit scores are in these following ranges. This one is, is kind of the FICO model that everyone is, is typically familiar with. And if we're using that model, Typically, your good credit starts around the mid to upper 600s up to about 850. So there's no exact science as to how a credit score is determined, but there are certain things that affect a credit score. Probably the most important one is whether or not you pay your bills on time. Another factor is how many recent applications you have for credit. The more new accounts you have, the more likely it is that potential creditors may think that you uh, may be having trouble paying your bills or, or are unable to stick to a budget. Uh, therefore, it's important to, to be aware of how many credit applications you have out, how many accounts you have open. So another point of advice on this uh, topic is to be careful of uh, too many credit applications, things for like uh, store credit card offers. You would want to weigh the benefits of the discounts received uh, for signing up for a store credit card against the impact that it may have on your credit score. Of course, that is a personal decision, uh, but it is something to bear in mind. Another factor that may affect your credit score is your mix of credit. Generally speaking, uh, a, a healthier credit history has different types of of loans out there or different types of credit. Uh, so you, you kind of want your credit history to show a mix of both long-term loans and short-term loans, uh, as well as revolving accounts such as credit cards, and you want to show that you are paying those timely. Uh, doing this may, you know, likely shows a potential creditor that you are at a lower risk of default. And lastly, another item that affects your credit score can be your credit utilization ratio. This is the amount of credit that you use divided by your total available credit. Uh, ideally, again, no hard and fast rule, but ideally you want to keep your credit utilization ratio under 30% of what you have available to you. Now, there are resources out there to get a free credit report, but the one that we recommend the most is the, the the one that's backed by the government, it's authorized by federal law, and that is annualcreditreport.com. Uh, it used to be that you could only request one of these for free once a year, but recently um, it has been made permanent that the credit bureaus are offering free copies every week. Now, requesting a free one every week is probably a little bit of overkill, but at a minimum, our department requests or I'm sorry, our department recommends that you review your credit report at least annually. Checking your credit report is one of the most important things you can do on at least a yearly basis. And you want, like I said, you want to check to make sure that there are no inaccuracies or any potential indicators of identity theft. So with all of that out of the way, we can start getting into credit counseling services. If you uh, need assistance in disputing uh, inaccurate debts or possibly paying off legitimate debts that are on your credit report. So licensed credit counselors in this state offer th three different types of services. The first one being a debt management plan or a DMP. This is when a credit counselor uh, 
receives access to a pool of money that you give them that they then uh, figure out a strategy to distribute among your uh, multiple creditors. Another, another service that they can offer is credit repair. Uh, so this is offering to improve a person's credit record, history, or rating, uh, usually by disputing items on your credit report. There's also services for debt negotiation and settlement. This is when a credit counselor reaches out to your creditors directly to attempt to negotiate perhaps a lower amount owed or a timetable for repayment, something that that would hopefully avoid uh, a creditor from taking uh, legal means to try and collect on the debt. Now, not all credit counseling organizations offer all three of these types of credit counseling services. Some might offer one or two or possibly all, but it is important to choose one that offers the services that meet your specific needs. Now, licensed credit counselors in the state do have several requirements in order to maintain their license, which I'll go over in the next couple of slides. Uh, one of the big things that a credit counselor must provide uh, a consumer if they're engaging in credit counseling services, they must provide you with a credit education program that is designed to improve your financial literacy. So it's supposed to help you uh, improve your budgeting education, uh, strategies for uh, working through your debt and, and to put you on a better financial step. Business must also provide you with a thorough and written budget analysis. So if you go to a credit counselor and ask for services, they have to look through your financial history and your budget. They need to determine whether or not the services are actually suitable for you. And if uh, you can reasonably meet the requirements of the budget analysis for their services. Uh, credit counselors also have maximum amounts that they can charge people, uh, and this amount is set by law. And also, credit counselors must provide you with a written contract that is compliant with South Carolina law. Now, once you've signed up with one of these credit counselors, uh, there are certain things they must do regarding how they, they treat your money. Uh, for instance, if they have you in a debt management plan, any funds that you pay to the credit counselor to in turn pay to your creditors must be placed in a trust account and must be distributed within five days of receiving it. Once this is done, you must be given a signed dated receipt. Uh, or access to the receipts upon request. Uh, as I said, your funds have to be kept separate in a trust account. They cannot be commingled with uh, the business's funds or any other funds uh, that the business has. And uh, they must provide you with an accounting of the transactions at least once every three months or within a week um, with a written demand from the client uh, so long as it doesn't exceed more than three times in the six month period. Now let's talk about allowable fees. There are certain fees that credit counselors are allowed to provide for the certain services that they provide. Um, as you can see here on this slide, they're generally the same. Uh, they can offer things like initial consultation fees and that's capped at $60 across the services offered. Uh, there is a plan set up fee for debt management plans. And if you look at the maintenance fees, they're typically $70 if um, there's multiple creditors for the client. It's not to exceed $10 per, uh, per individual creditor, but it cannot go over $70 in total. Uh, for debt management plans, a service fee can be uh, charged upon approval from our department. And that would be $10 per month for additional fee. And if you look at credit repair, you'll note that uh, a client cannot be charged more than $50 a month for the services. That's, what, that's what's known as a monthly maintenance fee. Now, a reinstatement fee is basically something if uh, uh, a person 
kind of drops out of the program and then comes back into it, uh, then a credit counselor would be able to charge a one-time $25 reinstatement fee. So like with physical fitness, it is important to choose a licensed entity uh, to do services with. That is very important because there are certain things that licensed credit counselors must do, such as maintain a surety bond and pass a criminal background check. They must provide their own financial information to demonstrate that they have financial fitness to give financial advice. And they must complete 12 hours of continuing education every two years. They must also abide by all other applicable laws. Now, um, it's important for potential clients to know that there is a right to cancel credit counseling services. The disclosure must be stated in the contract near the signature line. And basically, um, the right to cancel is that a contract or a debt management plan may be canceled at any time for any reason, so long as the client gives the credit counselor 10 days notice. Now, once this notice is given, and we recommend that you do it in writing, but once it is given, uh, you are entitled to a refund of any of the unexpended funds that you have paid. So if you put money into that pool to pay back to your creditors and it has not yet been paid, uh, you are entitled to receive a refund of that money. So for the most part, a lot of the things that uh, credit counselors provide are things that consumers can do on their own. Of course, it is, it is worthwhile to consider a credit counselor just because of their knowledge of the industry and the time commitment that it can take to um, sort through uh, the credit uh, reporting dispute process. It is a pretty intensive process and people uh, may prefer to, to pay a professional to do it. But uh, there are some debt reduction strategies that both credit counselors may use in debt management plans that consumers can also use. Um, basically, they fall into two, two different uh, approaches to reducing one's debt. The first one being the debt avalanche. Now, the approach here is to pay the minimum on all debts that someone has uh, with extra payments going to the debt with the highest interest rate. Now, once that debt with the highest interest rate uh, pays off, uh, you would then take that money that you were putting towards that particular debt and move it over into the account that has the next highest interest rate until all debts are paid off. Uh, the idea behind this approach is to attempt to uh, pay as little as one can in interest, but there is another uh, approach to reducing debt, and that is what's known as the debt snowball. Now, under this approach, a person would pay the minimum on all debts with extra payments going to the debt with the smallest balance. And when that smallest balance is paid off, you go up to the next smallest balance. Um, so basically, it's attacking the problem from two different um, positions. One, you're more concerned about interest. Maybe the other one, you're more concerned about getting as many of the debts paid off as quickly as you can. But the important thing uh, with any of these strategies is to develop a plan to get your debts under control and to pay off your creditors on time. Um, of course, if you are attempting to reduce debt on credit cards, you must plan on not adding to that credit card balance uh, while you're attempting to reduce your debt for these strategies to work. It is important to be wary of credit counseling scams. This is a uh, this is a market that is uh, vulnerable to scams. Uh, there are many unlicensed credit counselors out there uh, offering all sorts of things that they cannot deliver. But uh, just to give you kind of an idea of what to watch out for if you are in the market for credit counseling services. You want to be, uh, you want to avoid companies that insist that you pay up front before they help you. Uh, as you saw in one of the previous slides, they cannot charge you for work uh, before it is done. It must be, uh, it, it, the work must be done before they are paid. Uh, you also 
do not want to uh, engage with anyone who tells you not to contact a credit reporting agency directly or your creditor directly. If they're telling you to shut off communication, that is a red flag. Uh, you also uh, should look out for companies telling you to dispute information that you know is accurate. Uh, legally, you cannot erase items on your credit report that you legitimately own. The dispute process is for inaccuracies in your credit report. Um, another red flag is a company that tells you to lie on a credit application for credit or loan. Or if they don't explain your legal rights to you and they tell you what they can do for you. Uh, this is one to look out for too. Um, companies that promise to create what's called a new credit identity. Um, so this is a red flag of a scam. Uh, basically, they may ask you to use uh, what's known as a CPN or a credit privacy number. Uh, this is a nine digit number that is formatted like a social security number. It has other names such as a credit profile number or a credit protection number. Uh, there are companies out there purporting to sell these CPNs and marketing them as replacement social security numbers. Uh, promoting the idea that these CPNs are legitimate. For example, we've seen one site advertising CPNs claiming that the numbers are, quote, fully tri-merged with the Social Security Administration. But the fact of the matter is these companies are scam artists and they're essentially attempting to engage you so that they can obtain your legitimate Social Security number by dubious means. Scammers may also ask you uh, to apply for an EIN or an employer identification number from the IRS, uh, similar to a CPN, this is not a substitute for your social security number. And lastly, I've kind of already hit on this already, but uh, a major red flag is any business that's promising to hide your negative credit history or bankruptcies. That is not something that a uh, credit counselor can legally do. So that's the end of my uh, credit counseling section, but this slide applies to both Adam's section on Physical Fitness uh, Services Act and um, my Credit Counseling Act. Uh, violations of both of those acts are an unfair trade practice by law. Uh, basically, the remedy for this is triple damages and attorney's fees. And uh, that is something if you, um, encounter issues that you think might be a violation of either one of these acts that you would need to speak to a private attorney for. Um, the, rem the, the avenue to um, seek remedies under the unfair trade practices is, a, uh, is a, a matter in court and our department cannot give legal advice. So definitely speak to a private attorney for any um, action for unfair trade practices. Now, I'll also point out here that uh, specifically our YouTube page, we have all these webinars recorded and stored there at uh, SCDCA TV. Uh, the, the one that I have here on the screen is a playlist for different topics about credit. So if you are interested in credit issues specifically, we do have a wealth of information there. We also publish a whole bunch of different consumer guides on all sorts of topics uh, related to credit, uh, auto purchases, all sorts of other things, uh, ID theft. So um, I would invite you to go to our website to, to check out any one of these or uh, give us a call or shoot us an email if you would like a hard copy mailed to you. All right, well, hopefully we've answered everyone's questions now and they will certainly uh, check out um, our website to see if any gym or physical fitness center that they are looking into or any credit counselor that they may be interested in engaging, uh, just making sure that they are licensed. But other than that, I hope everyone has a good day and a good rest of their week and happy new year.